1603, James VI outlawed the clan MacGregor after they had attacked the Cahoons. The MacGregor women were branded, and even just to have the name made them a target. He forbade all its members to use the name MacGregor. But there was one who went on to become infamous the following century. That was Rob Roy. Little is known of Robert MacGregor's formative years, but by 1710 he was a 40-year-old businessman who traded on the banks of Loch Lomond. Most clans had lands and castles, but the MacGregors were the exception to the rule. To earn a living, they traded in cattle, not always their own, stealing them from their neighbours. By assuring these neighbours they would protect their livestock for cash, it was the perfect business deal for MacGregor and his clansmen. The Act of Union in 1707 saw prices soar, but even so, MacGregor managed to purchase small parcels of land, although most of the territory he worked belonged to James Graham, first Duke of Montrose, a man who had backed the Union. As a result, he'd gained an estate. He was rich and powerful, his wealth too good an opportunity to miss for Rob Roy. In 1712, he found himself at a meeting with Montrose's accountant, John Graham of Calern, offering to buy £200 worth of cattle to drive south. He said the cattle would be driven by Creef that July, but they never appeared. He stole the money from Montrose, possibly to shore up his own business. But when the news reached Edinburgh, his name was read out at the Market Cross, and he was officially made an outlaw. Meanwhile, he'd been shrewd enough to distribute his own cattle between his family and friends he could trust. Montrose was furious. Not that he'd lost the money, but that his trust had been broken. MacGregor needed to find somewhere to hide out, so he turned to the man who hated Montrose most, John Campbell, Duke of Argyll, and Chief of Clan Campbell. He was a distant relative of MacGregor's, and around 60 years beforehand, his great-grandfather fought Montrose's great-grandfather during the Civil War so anyone who did anything against Montrose was in favour with Argyll. MacGregor and his followers were given refuge in Glenorchy. With his reputation decimated, he decided to write his side of the story. He claimed he was three days' walk from Skye when they met two Uist men. They accompanied them and made camp for the night. But the next morning, the Uist men and the money were gone. Soon there were bigger issues to deal with. Queen Anne died in 1714, leaving the throne vacant. George I became king, but the Stuarts still had a claim through James Stuart, known as the Old Pretender. He had supporters in Scotland, after all, only a small percentage of Scots agreed to the Union, and the Jacobites were gaining in numbers. MacGregor had to choose a side. Leaving the safety of Argyll's lands, MacGregor made his way to Perth, then Creef, where he heard of George I's coronation. He chose the Stuart cause and the Jacobites. In September 1715, the Jacobite standard was raised at Bray Mar, and John Erskine, sixth Earl of Mar, controlled all of the lands north of the River Forth. But at Stirling, 6,000 government troops held firm. MacGregor was given the rank of Colonel, and he and his men were ordered to join a raid on Inverary, where the Duke of Argyll was commander of the government troops. A few shots were fired. Then they left after a few days. 
McGregor was not stupid. Argyle had sheltered him, and he felt indebted to him. And it transpired he was relaying Jacobite information to him. Needless to say, some of the letters were discovered, and McGregor was accused of being a spy for the government forces. He managed to wheedle his way out of the accusations, but things came to a head on 13th November 1715 at Sheriff Muir. Neither side won, but the battle was five hours in before McGregor and his men appeared on the field. By this point, he was the kingdom's most wanted man. He fled to the highlands where he was pursued by government forces. His home was burned to the ground and he was one of 49 Scots convicted of high treason for their part in the uprising. Argyll, meanwhile, lost command of the government army, but his biggest threat was that MacGregor would be captured by Montrose. He put the word out that he was a safe haven for him if he stayed out of trouble. MacGregor accepted the offer of a hideout, but continued to steal cattle from Argyll's lands. He also felt he was being persecuted by Montrose, so headed to Drimmon in Stirlingshire, to kidnap Calern, Montrose's accountant, in November 1716. He was using him to negotiate. He wanted all his debts cancelled, compensation for the burning of his house, and taken back by Montrose. It was never going to happen. MacGregor later discovered Calern had collected over £3,000 Scots in rent money so released him after a week. Keeping the money, of course. News of the incident spread, and it was clear he was being protected by someone. That was Argyle. In the spring of 1717, Montrose sent Calern to see MacGregor again to offer him life, liberty and treasure if he would bear false witness against Argyle. MacGregor refused and published details of the incident in a letter, knowing full well he had Argyle's protection. Adam Coburn of Ormiston, Scotland's leading judge, was a close ally of Montrose and somehow enticed MacGregor to a meeting in the early summer of 1717. John Murray, the Duke of Athol, supported the government but three of his sons supported the Jacobite cause. Athol agreed to lure MacGregor into the countryside through his son's connections with the Jacobites. On 3rd June, MacGregor arrived at his house in Dunkeld, where Athol threw him into his private jail. However, this was Rob Roy, and in true Rob Roy style, he escaped and made his way to Balquidder, where he, his wife and children went into hiding. It was the last time he was imprisoned. Again, he tried to write his way out of trouble, explaining how he hated Montrose and Athol, and ended it with a challenge to Montrose for a duel. MacGregor by this time was 47, with a £200 bounty on his head from King George's personal funds. No one gave him up. In 1719, another Jacobite rising took place and MacGregor led 40 troops at the Battle of Glenshiel. However, he soon realised it was futile and ran. A year later, his land ownership papers turned up and his lands were put up for sale. At the auction, Montrose paid 820 English pounds, paying well over the odds, but it was worth it to him, as he'd never been able to catch MacGregor, and knew it would pain him. In 1723, when he was 52, MacGregor's life story was published in London, although the author was unknown, but most likely MacGregor himself. 
In the story, he gave money to local farmers and stole it back from ruthless landlords. In reality, he couldn't show faith. So it fell to his wife and family to run the family business. Scotland was still relatively lawless at the time, but to tame the Highlands, new roads were being built and patrolled. General Wade, the father of these roads, met MacGregor, who he'd only read about. It was during the meeting Rob Roy pled his case, asking for forgiveness from the King, and said his wish was to live peaceably. He also swore allegiance to the King. But it was all a ruse. Nonetheless, on 2nd December 1725, he received his pardon. However, his story wasn't quite over. At Belquidder in 1733, 62-year-old MacGregor faced the battle of his life. He'd had a falling out with a neighbour over a small piece of land, and a duel ensued. The first to draw blood was the winner, and Rob lost. The wound never healed, and he spent the last few months of his life in bed, being attended to by his wife, Mary. When visitors came, however, he insisted on being dressed in full Highland garb. He died in his bed on 28th December 1734, aged 63. It was the birth of his legend. This legend continues to fascinate to this day. There are films and books about him, and statues are dotted round the country. The main draw is his grave at Balquidder, where Queen Victoria visited in 1869. Such was the draw of this Highland rogue.